thumbs up, we'll uh, we'll get rolling if you're good. good. Very good. Ready to go. <clears throat> well, we're going to tag team on this one, and um, I'll turn it over to our peers in just a second. But I wanted to uh, introduce myself and my team. My name is Christopher Nicholson with the Canada West Ski Areas Association, and also Cynthia Thomas and Don Sleeman is here. So those that are part of the, the Canada West Ski Areas fraternity will recognize us. But we're super excited this, uh, this morning, this afternoon, to be partnering with the BC Hotels Association. And uh, I'll turn it over to Ingrid in just a, just a moment, but uh, really on behalf of uh, the Canada West contingency, uh, a big thank you to the partnership with BC Hotels Association that I should say, actually way back in March, we were at the tourism conference, provincial tourism conference, and uh, the sharing of best practices started then in that uh, with Ingrid's help, we were um, in the hallways on telephone calls trying to figure this whole thing out. So uh, not just for this session, but Ingrid and uh, to the whole association, thank you for being such great, uh, great industry partners. Uh, from a Canada West side, I also just wanted to quickly um, thank again our, our uh, partners with Driving Force and with Cal Tire. And uh, for any industry partners, there is a 10% discount with Driving Force as well as a $100 coupon with Cal Tire. And I'll put the link into the chat room. So Canada West people will be familiar with that, but also uh, others on the line. Uh, it is winter season, which we're very excited about, but that also means shifting tires. So uh, we'll put that link into the, uh, into the chat room. Um, so with that, this is a partnership with Canada West Ski Areas and BC Hotel Association. Uh, recognizing that there are accommodators, uh, sorry, ski areas with accommodations across Western Canada, not just in British Columbia, but the majority are, and we've been really fortunate. There's been a tremendous amount of work, uh, of course, by the accommodation sector, both in terms of protocols, best practices, as well as advocacy, uh, separate from the best practices. Uh, Ingrid and I spent a lot of time uh, working on, on different files for the benefit of industry. So again, a big thank you for that. But I'm going to turn it over to Ingrid and her team. And uh, with that, we'll get into the session. So I'll turn it over. Thank you, Christopher. Well, I'm delighted that uh, that conversation, which seems like a year ago now, when we were at the tourism conference together, that we've actually I think achieved quite a bit of the work that we were really concerned hadn't yet been done for the industry, given the pandemic. And we were both saying, where do we start? So I'm going to go through a little bit of the process between then and now, and hopefully be able to provide a framework by which the uh, ski industry and the accommodators that are interconnected with that uh, sector are able to get ahead of it while they're hiring, training and, and onboarding. So first of all, let me introduce myself. Um, just a minute, I need my, oh, there we go. Uh, this is me, I'm a BC girl, love skiing, and I'm really honored to be working uh, with my team, Christopher, providing the support that hopefully uh, will be beneficial for the ski industry for this coming season. And I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mike McLeod, who is our director, member, and business development. And um, Mike comes from a ski destination most uh, recently, that being Sun Peaks, and has been a great addition to our team. Mike and I will kind of go back and forth as we present today. And then we've also included some of the questions that were submitted that will be at the end of the Q&A. Just so that you know, we do have an open forum. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for that. So if you have questions that come up during our presentation, uh, please feel free to jot those down and then we'll do our best to address them. If we do run out of time, uh, reach out directly because we do, uh, or we are committed to making sure that we answer your questions and provide you the support that you need. As Christopher uh, discussed right from the beginning when the pandemic hit us in March, and we were, our first uh, advocacy that we were successful uh, garnering was actually being uh, deemed an essential service. So for the accommodators and all the subsectors of the accommodation industry in the province, that made an enormous difference for their ability as a business to determine, should I stay open? Am I going to close? Will I provide safe shelter for certain needs within the province? 
And in fact, some of you uh, on the call today may well have been open this entire time. I'm thinking the majority of you are reopening if you hadn't been open for a summer activity. So the first thing that we understood is as people are coming to stay overnight, one of the most uh, critical pieces here is what about housekeeping? And what, what is different now than last year? And as we roll through this slide deck, it's really important that you're keeping in mind the communication to people who are making reservations as they're checking in. And then again, when they're in the guest room so that they know what to expect and they know the new way of actually doing business and what is included and what isn't included. And also number one, that you have their safety and health and wellness first and foremost, when it comes to the uh, experience you're providing. So the first thing that we have is two buckets here. We have during a guest stay, and then we have after a guest stay. Uh, during a guest stay, uh, it means no turnover service. So no daily refresh. And this is happening throughout the province in all different sectors of the province. It means they need to understand um, you know, should they require additional linen or garbage pickup or any of the things that normally you would do during stayover that you have to communicate to them, how does that happen? So you normally would give them extra bags within the room, they can put their dirty linen, you can leave the clean linen outside the room. Um, making sure that the entire full supply of guest needs are in the suite ahead of their arrival. Um, again, their supplies and any during their stay are dropped off at the door. It'll make a big difference if you have a bag for linen and a bag for garbage with instructions for the guests so that they actually know, um, you know, what to do about that. After the guest departs, now before I talk about departure, I think one of the things that you'll need to look at is arrival departure times. Depending on the configuration and the length of stay, you may have to delay the arrival time and you may have to uh, bring forward the, the departure time so that you actually have enough time in between uh, without the guest in the room for your housekeeping teams to be able to clean the room. And it also means that you need to keep in mind that because you don't have stayover service, it may well take longer to clean the room because it'll be like a deep clean uh, between every stay. For your teams, very important that they have the approved cleaning uh, uh, products that are all labeled and that comes from PHO that all of this information is on our website. So anybody that needs the information when you're building your training plan or you're checking what uh, chemicals you're using or cleaning supplies, please make sure that you're checking the drug identification number and also uh, cleaning all the hard services uh, and making sure that any uh, single use items are discarded between stays. Now, any of you that are you can, using bulk amenities that may be affixed to the wall or on freestanding on your counter, again, those need to be filled and sterilized prior to the next uh, person coming and checking in. Physical distancing. So this is something I think we're all becoming very familiar with and uh, in housekeeping, in guest areas, and in an accommodation, whether it's a cabin, a lodge, an inn or a hotel or a motel, this stands true all the time. So your ability to use some of the arrows, making sure that you have signage, uh, whether or not you can put the dots on the, on the floor that actually allow somebody to understand what is six feet apart uh, when people are checking in or checking out. One of the things for check-in that we're seeing quite often now is actually scheduled arrival times so that you don't have everybody arriving, for example, at 4 p.m., which many of us in the industry would have uh, encountered previously. So all of this communication, when you provide it prior to their arrival, it makes sure that they're set up with an expectation of what to expect when they arrive. It's really important. Mike, over to you. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I haven't had a chance to uh, introduce myself, but as Ingrid said, I most recently came from uh, Sun Peaks. So I uh, certainly am a resource uh, for the ski industry um, if you've got questions after, after the presentation. And we will be making it available uh, on a recording as well. I saw a comment in the chat uh, 
while Ingrid was speaking. I wanted to touch on uh, briefly uh, public spaces, pools, spas, uh, spas or hot tubs. Uh, and really um, the thinking here on this particular part of the, um, of the of your operations or your accommodations is not so much in the pools, if we're talking about pools and hot tubs, uh, it's really the area around those spaces. So the pool decks, that's where again, the physical distancing is uh, what will take precedent in terms of whether you can open uh, or stay open, or if you need to control this, these areas in a different way. Uh, as Ingrid referenced, uh, and really whenever there's any doubt, the physical distancing um, measures really should be your guidance. And uh, so if, if it comes to, uh, if you feel like you may have issues with crowding or, or crowd control in some of these public spaces issues, uh, public space areas, uh, you may wanna consider you know, scheduling uh, timing uh, folks uh, to use the pool area or limiting times. Um, those will be sort of some best practices that you can kind of employ uh, to help yourself out. Um, a further note, we will be going into greater detail in our third session in this series on November 4th, dealing specifically with housekeeping, uh, pools, public spaces, etc. cetera. So uh, we'll go through this part fairly quickly, um, but again, we'll go into greater detail in a couple of weeks. Um, we've mentioned communicate, or Ingrid's mentioned communications uh, a, a number of times. Uh, having been uh, still at Sun Peaks when we reopened this summer after uh, a shutdown for uh, six or eight weeks or so, uh, we really found the communications pre-arrival piece is extremely important. Um, and we would recommend you get on that right away in terms of um, understanding how often you should be communicating to your customers uh, and, uh, and, not, and definitely take that piece of it uh, seriously. Uh, you wanna be clear, you wanna be concise um, and, and don't assume that all of our incoming guests are uh, up to speed on the latest and greatest in terms of how hotels are being managed and run. I think uh, one of the uh, takeaways that a lot of uh, hoteliers had this summer when, when reopening occurred across the province, not just in resort areas, was um, a lack of awareness from guests and guests sort of falling into uh, the old, uh, old habits, if you will. And uh, that was probably one of the number one things we heard around the province was uh, challenges dealing with guests. So I, we can't emphasize enough the pre-arrival piece, especially if you've got unique situations in your accommodation area uh, as it relates to arrival, uh, parking, uh, where they went, might take their equipment uh, after arrival, those types of things. So make sure that you're, you're communicating early, often, and uh, very clearly. Um, physical distancing, um, again, if you haven't experienced a hotel uh, you know, arrival, if you haven't gone, uh, taken a trip this summer yourself, uh, absolutely make use of the uh, signage, um, barriers at, at check-in, those types of things. Uh, ensure that you're uh, doing yourself a favor to, to kind of create a situation where you're not having lineups and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and wherever possible, contactless check-in, uh, whether that's pre-arrival, uh, authorizations for credit cards, uh, uh, in, uh, detailed instructions on where guests should be uh, arriving to and, and their kind of entry points and exit points, etc. cetera. Uh, if uh, we know that's not possible in every situation, but uh, the, the more we can do to kind of limit the, uh, the contact at check-in is helpful. Thank you, Mike. Um, one of the things that uh, we, one of the entities that we partner very closely with is WorkSafe BC and GoToHR. And one of the things about creating a safety plan is actually that you have the communication on your website, in your reservation confirmation email, that you are communicating it at check-in of what is expected. And one of the things that we've seen over the last few months is mitigating guests who are not adhering to the protocols is really minimized when uh, you have been able to be very clear about what their responsibility is while they're actually in your uh, accommodation hotel or destination. And increasingly, I think there is also some great communication examples around the self-responsibility that we all hold 
to adhere to the protocols that a village or a, or, or a ski resort or a hotel will um, determine that that is the way that it is uh, at that specific place. And I'll refer to things like uh, three, three months ago, there were very, uh, there was much less people that were actually wearing masks inside public places. Today, in almost any accommodation that you would go in or a public place, people are in fact wearing masks. So those kind of determinants are something that you're going to have to think about as an operator. And if we have uh, ski resorts that have a village uh, or, you know, multiple properties, those are the kind of things as a village, I think that would really afford you an opportunity to work together on, on what that would be. Um, now, creating the safety plan, one of the most important things that you do, it is mandated uh, by the Minister of Health. It is enforced by WorkSafe BC. Uh, you need to have it in writing and you need to have uh, trained your teams and update it as the health orders change. There's examples of safety plans on both the GoToHR website and the BCHA website and we're more than happy to assist you uh, with that. Oops, sorry, I seem to not be able to go to the next slide. Okay, there we go. So the first thing in creating a safety plan is assessing the risk. So where potentially could there be uh, a risk of physical, not, not an ability to physical distance? And how do you manage that? To Mike's point, when he was talking about pool decks or you know, that kind of area, very often you need somebody in a public space that will be making sure that people in fact are adhering to your protocols. And just reminding people, this is the door in, this is the door out. Um, and making sure also, you know, in our industry, we used to be experts at being behind the scenes with our cleaning protocols. And it was like magic. You know, the, the hotel was always clean and nobody ever saw anybody cleaning. Well, the opposite is true today. Everybody wants to see people cleaning. It provides a comfort and an understanding that you have their health in order. So that would be the sign on the back of the public washroom door. Every time somebody goes in there and cleans the counters and the washrooms, they need to sign it uh, in the public spaces the same. You need to think about those shared tools and equipment, such as a pen at check-in. You know, you need an area where somebody has touched a pen and then you need to sterilize it. And then each person needs a clean pen, for example. And you really need to make sure that you're involving your frontline workers to make sure that they're involved in identifying those high risk areas and coming up with solutions and therefore co-writing that safety plan so that there is real ownership around how to operate and make sure that we're all kept safe. Here is a diagram of how to reduce risks and this is the foundation for developing your safety plan. First of all, you have to eliminate the risk. So that is one door in, one door out. So there's a flow and then for it, and that is one example. Another example would be uh, making sure that you do have a certain number of people that can be in your workspace at one time. Rearranging your workspace so that if you have a family of four, they can sit in a grouping of four and that you're not mixing groups of people that wouldn't normally be in a bubble. So that's very different again to the public areas of how we used to have the configuration. Um, that uh, physical distancing is of critical importance and people are familiar with it now, but it still needs to be enforced. So that's really eliminating the risk. The second step to that is engineering controls. And that is potentially a barrier between the, your person checking somebody in, the person cleaning would be that the, the, the guest has already departed uh, making sure that you have barriers, plexiglass, we're seeing it everywhere. It doesn't have to be plexiglass, but as an example, that really allows communication, eye contact, and engagement, and at the same time, there being a barrier between uh, the guest and your, uh, your team. Administrative controls is very much like similar to an occupancy uh, limits would be an example of that, and very much one way in one way out, walkways and hallways. 
signage, arrows, you know, I used to say, oh, no, don't put signs up. Now it's like, make sure you've got the signs up. Because as you walk in the building, even what is expected and you have those signs is an example that you have your safety plan, that you have the guest intention and their health and wellness, and that your team understands that's already been communicated. So don't shy away from signs. They're very, very important right now. And then the fourth level of this is your protective equipment. Originally, everybody thought, well, if we wear a mask, everything will be just fine. But in actual fact, these three elimination, engineering, and administrative of those controls and the risks are of paramount importance. Then, as an added safety, it's about your mask. The policies and the guidelines for every business is very important. So you have, you'll have you have your code of ethics and you'll have the agreement when somebody signs a, a, a employment contract. In addition to that, you need to think about these four key areas. Sick leave policy. So, you know, don't come to work if you're sick. If you're not feeling well, you need to stay home. That's personal responsibility. So you need to be able to have a policy that will enable people to actually do that. Uh, personal hygiene policy. What does that look like? Washing your hands as often as you can. Making sure that you have the sterile stations. If somebody, there isn't running water in an area, then having a sanitation station is an appropriate thing to do. What about if somebody is working at home? Do you have a safety policy so that there will be a buddy system to walk home or that somebody comes in from a security perspective and make sure that they're safe? And then of course, the bullying and harassment policy, which is a federal uh, and a provincial jurisdiction. And I know GoToHR has some marvelous, uh, really great training around just making sure that we're all looking after each other and we're operating in a great way. And Mike, uh, the next slide is for you. Right, so again, uh, you know, my earlier uh, comments were really around the communications piece. And uh, this really, this slide really relates to uh, the onboarding of your staff that might be coming back, uh, and particularly if they're new staff, uh, to make sure that um, you know the reorientation and onboarding is not overlooked. Uh, regular employee communication, so that would be pre-arrival if if someone's coming in from another province, for example, to to join your team, make sure that there's plenty of communication before arrival. Uh, that they have the information and the point of contact to make sure that uh, they know where to turn if they've got questions or, uh, or, or that sort of thing. Uh, make sure your policies and documentation are clear. Um, and always, always make sure that the communication to customers and the public is visible, uh, whether that's via email prior to, uh, via social media, via the website, and obviously at check-in. I think um, although, you know, guests are uh, still going to try and fall back into their old patterns of, of how they've always arrived to hotels or to, to ski resorts. Uh, I, I don't think, I, I think the feeling from the field, at least this summer, is that they will take a few extra minutes to check in to listen to what might be going on uh, specific to your resort and, and the instructions that uh, you're trying to provide. But make sure you're, you're setting your team up for success. Um, and of course, finally would be uh, some of the uh, questions to ask uh, to include in communication. This would be two guests. Um, but, you know, again, some of these may seem familiar to all of us uh, on a day to day basis, but uh, uh, we don't want to overlook or assume that guests are thinking in this uh, fashion because they, after all, they're trying to enjoy a ski vacation and uh, getting away and that sort of thing. But it, falls back on personal responsibility. So we should be asking the questions. It's okay to ask the questions in your communication about, are you feeling well? Have you been outside the country in the last 14 days? Uh, has there been an issue in your bubble in terms of uh, someone testing positive or, or that sort of thing? Uh, and uh, we notice by following what's going on in the ski world, uh, the slogan, don't be the reason we lose the season. Uh, we like that. We're gonna we're gonna hold on to that and carry that forward on your behalf as well. But uh, uh, you know that speaks to what um, 
Inger was saying a little a few moments ago about uh, the responsibility really within your own accommodation area, but also within the, the wider resort that you represent and making sure that everyone has that same attitude, whether it's an employee, a guest, um, or uh, the operations team. Inger, do you want me to keep going with this part? Um, I, I, I'll take this slide. So the, some of the questions that we uh, most commonly ask, and they really are the differences year over year, is one is there's no stay over service. Um, and, and I think if you communicate that ahead of time, it'll be understood. Um, and I think it brings comfort to the people that are traveling and coming to a ski resort that there isn't people that they don't know coming in and out of their space that they've rented for hopefully a five to seven or a 10 day ski holiday. Um, really think about operationally. What are you gonna do about garbage? How are you gonna manage that? Is it a daily pickup at a certain time? Uh, you may have to rejig the scheduling within your departments in order to pick up and drop off supplies and linen. Uh, what about food delivery? We're seeing a significantly more delivery, people phoning out instead of going out to restaurants, especially since we have the 50% capacity in restaurants, which is actually for many restaurants been a lifesaver because they can still sell more than they can actually seat people in their space uh, and enable some real some creativity when it comes to delivery. Um, the other thing is in-room amenities. Um, if you have a restriction on those so that you only have one um, amount or a small amount to have for their first night stay, um, maybe, the, maybe the opportunity is to communicate that in your pre-arrival so people are bringing their own. What about luggage handling and parking? You know, I think of myself often carrying my skis around and unloading my car with my groceries or whatever when I, when I come for my week of skiing. We need to think of those ahead of time so that when the guest actually comes to check in, it hasn't been a negative experience for them. So it really is making sure that you, you hold them preciously from a guest experience perspective, but that you've got the operation behind the scenes set up to be able to deal with it. So monitoring your workplace, um, you know, as we work very closely with Work B Safe BC, when they come to check, which they will do, they will actually speak directly with your employees. And so when you're looking at your workplace and you're looking at who your partners are, developing your safety plan, doing the training, doing the refresh, checking in with housekeepers or front desk clerks or your engineering team or whoever it might be, make sure that it isn't just the supervisor sitting down and making up a plan and say, there, that's done, because that is not the plan that they're looking for. Uh, you need to have evidence in writing that you have a plan. And we actually do have a, a safety plan workshop set up, so we can help you with that if you need it. So you need effective supervision and you need to hold people to account. You need those checklists, as I was talking about, public areas, how often do they, you know, clean the doors and the door handles and the elevators or the, um, or the table in the lobby or whatever it might be. Um, and then again, you need to make sure that you know exactly who's in the room, how to contact them, their date of stay in their restaurant. You have to take their phone number and their name and the date so that you can contract trace if, uh, if necessary. And those maintaining records and contract tracing is critical. We never did that before, and that is going to be new. And sometimes you'll have to ask people during a stay many times for their contact information. So that's another thing that they need to know to expect. During a WorkSafe BC inspection, these are the things they're looking for. They want to see the working the safety plan, and they want to be able to speak to people and make sure that they understand it and they had a part of it. Evidence of implementation is what I was just talking about. Uh, employee understanding of the procedures, and then focusing on the hygiene elements within the safety plan. So it's not difficult, but it is, it is very detailed as they're looking to look at it. Mike, over to you. Right, and uh, just before I talk, touch on some uh, resources, I wanted to add in, uh, Ingrid and I took a tour through the Kootenays um, a couple of weeks back and even within that region different cities were reporting or different uh, locations were reporting 
different levels of inspections from either health authorities or WorkSafe. So uh, as Ingrid mentioned, they are out there looking. Uh, some, uh, some cities reported seeing them three times. Uh, others reported only seeing them once or not at all. So uh, just be prepared. And, uh, and uh, that's sort of word to the wise in, in that uh, respect. If you haven't uh, had that experience already this summer. Um, so we uh, obviously are a, a, a membership-based uh, organization, BCHA, and uh, we have made available uh, some great uh, recovery um, guidelines as well as resources. Uh, the links are on the screen there. Uh, they are accessible to, uh, to anyone. So if you're not a member, they're still accessible. You can have a look at, uh, you know, on the recovery resource guide, for instance, if there's uh, something that you saw in this presentation that uh, you haven't ordered or you feel like you might need to stock up more, there might be some, some uh, providers there that you can uh, uh, access uh, there. And as well, uh, you can certainly uh, learn more about us as an association and uh, how we are out there and being the voice of the accommodation industry uh, from our member benefits page. There's lots of great information about uh, what we do and some of the uh, value adds that you can access from being a member. So I encourage you to, to have a look at that. I think we will move to some of the uh, submitted questions and then we'll take uh, some more questions via the chat uh, function as we- Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, I, I will just say when this pandemic hit in the spring, uh, we were having calls from property. How do I close my hotel? And then we had, uh, how do I open my hotel? Uh, is there certain ways that I can close or open that would uh, afford me some savings from an energy perspective? Or what about the physical plant of a hotel? So within that resource guide that um, Mike was just referring to, one is procurement or buying uh, benefits, which uh, by because it's membership, there will be pricing that will be geared to uh, the industry as a whole in British Columbia. But in addition to that, the recovery guidelines and under the COVID pages in the website are resources to for just about anything when it comes to an accommodator and it's there to share to support the industry as a whole. And if there isn't something there that you need, please reach out because we'll make sure we find it for you. So you did submit questions and, and we wanted there to be an open forum in case there was something that you have questions about already. So we just chose a few of them that we will address because they were, some of them we received uh, several times. And then we will, I think we'll have a couple of minutes to be able to uh, answer uh, live. And at that point, uh, Christopher and Mike and I can address that. So our first one is updated COVID mask protocols. Um, maybe I'll answer this one. Um, it's up to you to determine what spaces within your village, within your resort, or within your property you will mandate or recommend, that's up to you, wearing a mask. We're seeing increasingly in public spaces that are indoors that mask protocols are recommended and sometimes mandated. So that would be up to you as a business or a village um, or a resort to determine. And if you can do it in partnership with all the businesses in your ski resort, then that gives really takes away the guessing from a consumer or a guest perspective. So we do recommend get together with your resort and your partners with different uh, complementary businesses and determine, you know, how do we want to address that? If you can have the same kind of looking signage on behalf of one village, that goes a long way as well. It means that you're all in agreement that certain things are recommended or mandated, and it is completely uh, your right to do so. Mike, would you like to talk about this one or would you like me to? Uh, you can go for it. Okay, so originally when we were under quarantine and it was locked down, within the accommodation sector, we had people that were quarantined. We had people that were returning Canadians in isolation for 14 days. We were housing emergency first responders and uh, many, many others. During that time, the first guideline that came out of the Minister of Health determined that 72 hours was the amount of time between checkout and check-in. 
that was specifically for quarantine purposes. So now that number is three hours and that was which we introduced originally. So you can make it longer than three hours if you'd like to, but three hours is the recommendation from the Minister of Health. Mike? So uh, the question here is how do we manage uh, guests testing positive for, co for COVID while on property? Uh, do they stay quarantined or do they get moved? What is the protocol? So the, gui the guidance here would be um, there are uh, recommendations on the BC CDC website on how to handle uh, these situations. We recognize in the ski resort uh, areas around the province that in a lot of cases those are removed uh, or, the, or the remote um, locations. So testing may not be available right in your location. You may have to travel to uh, the nearest uh, larger town or city. Um, so in that case, obviously, uh, guests will need to, uh, you know, if, if, a, if a test is um, required, they'll have to travel to get that to get that test. But uh, the guidance on the um, on the uh, and our, on our recovery guide or our, our reopening policies that uh, we mentioned that are on the website is that the guests, if they have uh, determined that they are ill, they should stay in the room, and that uh, your property should make every effort to uh, deliver food, deliver necessities without entering the room. Um, and as I said, you need, then need to follow, follow local health uh, authority guidelines and practices. Now, very often if somebody gets ill while they're in the resort, you won't know if it's COVID or not, but if somebody's not feeling well, the key is don't go out and make sure that you're able to provide them what they need, which is generally, uh, food and, uh, and safety. Have we learned anything from other ski destinations that might have opened already? Uh, for example, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Christopher, would you like to answer this one? <laughs> yeah, the uh, great question. And I would say our entire positioning with the consumer and uh, government and regulators have been drawn uh, in large part from the best practices in Australia and New Zealand for th those, uh, those folks that are part of Canada West, there is a recorded session with our colleagues from Australia and New Zealand on their experience, best practices and so forth that you have access uh, to. And Ingrid, on your side, if, if that question comes from one of the uh, BCHA members, uh, we, can, uh, we can get that over to you. So uh, quick answer, absolutely. There is far too much to explain just here, but a lot of the best practices that the, and I'll actually say North America, not just uh, British Columbia, not just Canada, but the best practices that we have aligned with as an industry across the globe have been drawn on summer experience and definitely from Australia and New Zealand where they had a successful ski season. So as we go into government communication or guest communication, part of the aspects and the, the, the more local aspect here is talking to a, a local health official, for example, is the best practices that industry have developed have already been tested and proven in Australia and New Zealand. So we're going into a second ski season, not a first. Yeah, that's, it's just so great that we're able to learn from another jurisdiction like that. The next question are, what are the guidelines for in chalet service? For example, private chef, chalet hosts, daily housekeeping that our domestic VIP guests are requesting for this winter season. I think we detailed the housekeeping quite clearly for you, but it's a great question about, can you have a private chef come in for a catered dinner um, and um, what, what does that look like when you have a group of people? Within the uh, Minister of Health protocols, you can only have five people over and above the registered occupants in a chalet or in a guest room or a suite or a condo or whatever the configuration might be. So there is a number of people limitation. Yes, you could have a private chef come in and do a private dinner if they wanted to do that and you hired them but you must meet the protocols that you are traveling together, that you are a bubble, which of course you would be if you were all staying together at a ski resort, and that you have a limited number of people that can actually add to the number of occupants that are registered. And again, contract tracing, 
food and beverage protocols would step in here and be your guide as to how to do that. Is there any new research on different surface transmission? Um, you know, there really isn't. Um, we have uh, certainly kept up to date with the Minister of Health uh, best practices for what cleaning agents to use and on different surfaces, how to clean appropriately. And all of that again is in on the BCHA website under the COVID tab for cleaning guidelines. Um, and we do, there is no research right now on whether or not a table or a chair or wallpaper or a soft surface uh, would be different. It really is about that cleaning agent that you're using and making sure that you do it uh, regularly, that you track it, and that um, you're, you're just making sure that that is just part of your cleaning policy. And now we have an open forum. I'll just go to, um, this is how to connect with us. We have our different social media. And then I have one more slide that has uh, both Mike and myself email and contact information. And I will stop sharing my slides so that we can go to open forum uh, and we can answer as, uh, as you ask the questions. And there is a chat function in the bottom of your screen for those of you I'm just going to stop sharing here. Um, you can send us a chat question and I will do my best to allocate those. Um, thank you, Teresa. I see your question about the 50% capacity. One thing I will say is, is that this last week, and this is a, about capacity and using other space within a hotel um, or an accommodation that is purpose-built, such as conference centers, meeting rooms that historically would have been used for uh, groups of over 50 people. We have a limitation of 50 people. And if you are going into a Christmas season and you think about how many people are on the ski hill and that the restaurants are now at a reduced capacity, especially because there are some that have outdoor patio space that may be also restricted based on weather and what that looks like. If you do have purpose-built conference space, you are able to then under the food and beverage guidelines, be able to use that space for overflow of the restaurant. This literally was just confirmed to us with the Minister of Health uh, last week. We sent it out in one of our communiques and we'll be working with uh, banquet catering and food and beverage managers within the accommodation sector to ensure that they're well posed to, to make sure that they're also uh, engaged with their regional health authority and make sure that they're compliant. Now, um, This has not already been asked. There has been any guidelines for opening a sauna or a games room? That's an excellent question. Um, so the sauna and games room, they have not specifically uh, been issued. Um, although under the regional health authority, which uh, interestingly enough, do have sep different protocols than what the provincial health authority has. For example, Interior Health um, had protocols around pools that was different than what the Minister of Health did or Northern Health or Coastal Health. So I would recommend that going to your regional health authority for anything to do with spas, hot tubs, pools would be the most appropriate place for you to find your specific uh, guidelines for where your ski resort is. Um, I see a very uh, great question from you, Teresa. Very nice to see you on the call around the three hour protocol that you're understanding it had been removed and that all we need to do now is wait until the room is vacant. Um, I will commit to making sure that we actually provide an update to Christopher and everybody on the call today to make sure that we clarify, is it, does it remain at three hours? or is it literally that the room needs to be vacant? So thank you very much for bringing that up. 
Um, and Ian, I believe that I just uh, answered your question about the games room and the open sauna. You know, a games room provides some risk, which would be lots of touch surfaces. If we were having a pool game, do we share a pool cue? What about the balls? At this point, I think it's probably quite similar to a gym scenario where if it's managed and you're cleaning surfaces between people, so you would have to have a schedule of registering somebody coming in. It would have to be sterilized when somebody came in. They could use it for a certain period of time, depending on what was in the games room. And I think the more games you have and the more people, the more complex it becomes. So again, I would recommend under the Regional Health Authority to have a look at what that is. And I would suggest that um, there will be times when you look at it and it may be more difficult for you to manage in a way that you're confident that the cleanliness can be upheld. Uh, but there certainly are examples, for example, hot tubs uh, in uh, pools and spas at resorts where people book a time, they go in, they clean it, and then the next person comes in. You have to have the actual labor capacity to do that well. And that is, of course, an operational um, uh, expertise that you need to know that you have. What are your thoughts on fogging machines in areas like game rooms or high contact surfaces? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and also, uh, we have a question about will the presentation be available uh, to Canada's West members? Um, and I would suggest yes. Uh, we have a recording and we have the slide deck and we're, we're more than happy to share it. We're also happy if you have additional questions to reach out to us directly. Um, fogging machines in areas like games rooms. We have not seen, nor have we been told about the evidence of fogging machines and that you could use a fogging machine in the place of cleaning sanitary surfaces. I think when fogging machines came out, and I'm speaking from my perspective here, um, they are not included in any of the health protocols from the Minister of Health. Uh, we have many brands and many businesses who are using them. And I think there is a perceived uh, consumer confidence that they could amplify or provide a, uh, a, a higher degree of cleanliness. But because they are not actually included nationally, internationally for North America or provincially, uh, it behooves us to really focus on what they have recommended and ma mandated that we do well, which is using very specific cleaning agents, cleaning in very specific ways with uh, a regular um, uh, schedule and making sure that we are really cognizant of the number of people are coming and going and that we are wearing masks when we can't physical distance, I think are, are the critical pieces. I'm seeing another chat or another question. From Mariko, we have several types of accommodations. One is a hostel, traditionally shared rooms and shared bathrooms and are planning to change it to private rooms. But is there rules and regulations set for hostel accommodations? Are we allowed to put non-cohort individuals in each room if there is a six foot distance between the beds? Thank you for this question. I meant to bring it up when we were talking about configurations of accommodations at a ski resort. You know, we actually, uh, with the help of some hosteling managers, develop the hosteling best practices and protocols. It does sit on the BCHA website. In addition, we have B&B &B best practices that again, had we had a group of bread and breakfast uh, owner operators that did that in compliance with the, the Provincial Health Authority and, uh, and our team. So I'm going to recommend that you go to the hostel. There is very specific measurements and uh, specific uh, configurations in hostel settings where you could have a room where you had multiple people that are not cohorts, but those distancing measures are of critical importance. So bcha.com slash COVID 
uh, best practices. And you'll see there's a whole section for hostels. Now, I'm not seeing any other questions. Christopher, would you like to say a few words or Mike, do you have anything to add? Well, I've got two things. One was um, uh, just in terms of one question. I know we had talked at the beginning of the process around group buying and the question around the supplies for and procurement for different supplies, in this case, pandemic related. Uh, can you speak to what supplies may be available through uh, BCAJ uh, buying program, and then that's a membership thing. So what the BCHA membership looks like. So the first part is the pandemic supplies, anything there as well as uh, membership. Right, great question. Uh, mm -hmm. Great comment, Christopher, thanks. Uh, so the uh, pandemic supplies specifically, if you go to the resource recovery guide on uh, bcha.com, you will find uh, everything uh, categorized. So you should be able to find fairly easily what you're looking for what uh, in whatever category it happens to be, whether it's cleaning products or PPE, and in some cases, uh, other uh, materials. Uh, we do have a number on the group buying front. Um, and so I should say, I guess, back up for a second, those um, supplies uh, can be accessed sort of, you know, on, a, on an individual case by case basis or, or, or need. Uh, we do have uh, a number of group buying programs as part of membership, uh, probably most predominantly in the, in the uh, food procurement uh, area. Um, so in terms of membership, membership uh, provides you access to those, to those programs. Uh, membership is based on the uh, size of your property in terms of the due structure. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, but um, um, you know, and it also there's a few other variables there depending on the type of property you are, location you're in, those sorts of things. But predominantly, it's based on the size or number of guest guest room units that you would have uh, is how we determine. Membership. <laughs> and uh, be happy to talk through that individually with with anybody who is interested, or you can certainly uh, from the website uh, ask any questions that you, that you might wish. There's pretty good information there on the group purchase programs. Uh, in, pro in procurement of food and, and other goods, uh, as well as insurance, which is sort of a hot topic these days as well. So a couple of things to look for there if you're interested in membership. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I, I'm only laughing at insurance. Ding, ding, ding. That's a whole other gamut. Yeah, we'll no, talk no. about that. <laughs> but um, before Vern jumps in on that one, um, <laughs> I just on behalf of Canada West, I'm cognizant of time, so I want to keep us tight. But from a Canada West standpoint, a, a big thanks and a really strong strong urge for, to uh, the Canada West members to look at uh, BCHA and the membership because there's a whole variety of things there that Canada West doesn't do and won't do uh, or not moving into. So there's definitely some high value there. Um, I'll also say this is uh, extremely um, uh, valuable in terms of this presentation. And thank you both to Ingrid and Mike for this. It's, uh, it's also somewhat refreshing. I mean, we spent so much time focusing on lift lines, lift mechanics, avalanche, explosives, rentals, G school, all those other elements. And um, uh, most of our, certainly all of our overnight guests are in this gamut. So uh, I really want to thank you for this. As the members are aware, Canada West, there's a, there's a stream of uh, accommodation related uh, proposals coming up. So thanks to Ingrid and Mike for picking that up. And I think that originated with a conversation with Big White. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the next one. So on behalf of Canada, thank you. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Christopher. So we, um, you know, we're delighted to provide whatever support that we can. And um, I think Mike and I have both said reach out if we didn't cover anything that you're wondering about. And um, certainly within the resources, I would love to think that we could help you in benefiting when you're, you know, buying your cleaning products or your agents or your linen or your, you're doing a renovation or whatever it might be, please go and have a look. Our partners have been very generous and have really stepped up to support the industry. And, um, you know, we're an industry about looking after each other. We're a social, we're a whole pile of social creatures. And at the end of the day, we want to have a great ski season. We want to set an example uh, really around the world, not only about how extraordinary the skiing is, but how safe that everybody came, they had a great ski time, and then they're going to come back. And I think as we look to recover every one of these wins 
is going to put us in the right place at the right time when we can look at this behind us and say, thank goodness that was over. Uh, now, I don't know when that's going to be, but let's have a great ski season and we're happy to assist uh, however we're able. So thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. See you next week.